Hi, I'm Sherry Yannick, Churchill School Librarian, and today I'm here to read to you this book that I found absolutely fascinating. It was a story that I didn't know, and maybe you didn't either. It's called Ona Judge Outwits the Washington. An enslaved woman fights for freedom. It's written by Gwendolyn Hooks and illustrated by Simone Aglisoli. And you might be thinking, hmm, the Washingtons. She doesn't mean like George Washington or Martha Washington, does she? Unfortunately, yes, I do. And I think you'll find this story truly interesting. I want to judge out with the Washington. Young Ona Maria Judge was too little for housework. She had not grown strong enough for field work. Instead, she weeded, fed the chickens, and fetched water from the well. Fetching water was not a safe job for a small child, so you can see it a little bit closer. Ona would slowly lower the bucket deep down into the well. She was careful not to lean over too far. If she fell in, there would be no one to help her. The old folks who watched over the young were too feeble for such a rescue. Doesn't sound like a good job for a small child. Ona lived with her family on a Virginia plantation called Mount Vernon. They were all enslaved. Being enslaved meant they were considered legal property, like a mule or cornfield. Ona and her family lived and worked in harsh conditions for no pay. Almost 700,000 other black people in the United States did so too. So that means this time in history, there were 700,000 black slaves in America. Pretty terrible. The enslaved people at Mount Vernon were the property of George and Martha Washington. Yes, that George and Martha Washington. General Washington was one of the most famous men in the United States. He was the commander of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. American colonists fought the Revolutionary War against the British. The colonists won the right to make laws for themselves, at last independence. But nothing changed for Ona and most other enslaved people. In, um, throughout their newly independent country. They would work for the rest of their lives for their slaveholders. If they displeased their owners, they were often sold to other slaveholders. Sometimes slaveholders sold children. Mothers and fathers stood helpless and heartbroken as their children disappeared down the road. They would never see one another ever again. Owen knew the life that Ona knew life was a little easier inside the house than it was out in the fields. She hoped to work alongside her mother, Betty. Betty sewed for the Washington family. She also sewed and mended clothes for the enslaved people on the, of the plantation. Ona's little fingers were strong like her mother's, and she learned fast. Ona was about 10 years old the day Mrs. Washington sent for her. From then on, Ona would work inside the house with her mother. She learned to spin thread and weave cloth. She sewed quick and steady stitches. She added elegant touches to Mrs. Washington's dresses. Even General Washington praised her skills. Most importantly, Ona could be near her mother as they worked. One day a letter arrived. George, General Washington had been elected President of the United States. The letter from Congress declared that Washington had the support of the citizens of the United States, a free and enlightened people. Ona was taught nothing of freedom or enlightenment. She knew little about life beyond the plantation. Being curious or bright didn't matter. Ona was allowed to learn only about the work she was forced to do. Even if she was tired, hungry, or thirsty, Ona had to work and obey the Washington. Mrs. Washington organized the move from Mount Vernon to the capital, New York City. So back then, New York City was the capital of the United States. Who should she take along? She knew they would need enslaved workers in their new home. The Washington picked those they thought were honest, smart, and not likely to run away. Ona was chosen to go along. Her brother Austin and five other enslaved people were also, also chosen. In 1789, the Washingtons left Mount Vernon for their new home. New York City dazzled Ona. The streets bustled with foot traffic and carriages. 
Ona lived in the presidential mansion with the Washingtons. The president and Mrs. Washington paid white servants to work for them, but the enslaved workers received no pay. Ona was Martha's personal slave. She accompanied her everywhere. Ona rode a horse behind the carriage that carried Martha when she visited friends. She went with Martha on sightseeing trips around the city. Ona helped Martha bathe. Ona brushed Martha's hair. She repaired and pressed Martha's dresses. She kept Martha's fancy shoes with the golden thread spotless. At bedtime, she fetched Martha's Bible for her nightly reading. Ona had little time for herself. On Thursdays and Fridays, the Washingtons entertained their friends. These occasions were the only chance Ona had to relax and talk to Austin, the other enslaved people, and the white servants. Her conversations with them helped ease the pain she felt being away from the rest of her family. She couldn't wait to see them again. President Washington soon grew tired of city life. He wanted to visit Mount Vernon. Ona was thrilled they packed up the household and headed to Virginia. Ona wanted to tell everyone about her life in the president's house. She worked with the white servants, and she slept in the same house as them and the Washingtons. So that was unusual for most enslaved people at that time. They didn't live in the same house. Um, Ona worked hard in New York City. Her duties were tiresome. Still, she knew she was experiencing things that the people of Mount Vernon never would. Soon after they arrived home, Ona learned they would not return to New York City after all. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was the largest city in the United States and more centrally located than New York City. Philadelphia had been chosen to be the new capital and residence of the president. Wow. Ona's new home would be near Independence Hall, where men had signed the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. These important papers guaranteed rights and freedoms to citizens of the United States. But these documents did nothing for Ona. Because she was enslaved and treated as though she were property, she was not a citizen. For Ona, freedom was as far away as the moon. In Philadelphia, Ona's days and nights continued very much as they had in New York City, but the city itself was very different. People in Pennsylvania had begun to argue against slavery. Free black people walked around Philadelphia. They went to churches. Ona was curious about their lives, but she was careful when she asked them questions. Others might think she was plotting to escape. She didn't want the president to hear that she'd been asking about freedom. One day, Ona watched free black women selling pepper pot stew on the street. The aroma of meat and peppers and a thick broth swirled around her. The women used whatever meat they could afford. Hard work showed on their faces, but every penny they earned was theirs to keep. They didn't call anyone master. They were free. The women who stood before her proved that freedom was possible. If Ona escaped and was caught, she would be beaten. The Washingtons could sell her to a faraway owner. She would never see her family again. It was a very frightening thought. Ona knew the Washingtons would never set her free. To gain freedom, she would have to take the first step. Did she have the courage to run away? In February 1796, Mrs. Washington received a surprising letter. Her granddaughter, Elizabeth Betsy Parker Custis, would soon be remarry. Martha had bad news for Ona. Ona would be their wedding gift. Can you imagine giving away another person as a wedding gift? Mrs. Washington's news crushed Ona's fear. Ona knew Betsy well from her many visits to Mount Vernon. Could she bear Betsy's harsh demands and cruel punishments? The idea of living in Virginia sent shudders to Ona. In Philadelphia, Ona felt that freedom was within reach. But Virginia was a solid slave state. Enslaved people in Virginia who tried to escape often faced bloody beatings or were sold. It was time to act. Ona saw her chance the day Richard Allen arrived at the president's home. Richard was a minister, a chimney sweep, and a free black man. The Washingtons hired him to clean soot from their chimneys. Ona took a risk and asked him to help her run away. Richard, um, Reverend Allen, agreed to help. He alerted his trusted circle of friends. They planned Ona's escape throughout the leading north. They would tell Ona the plan one step at a time. 
Then if someone reported Ona, only one link in the chain of helpers would break, the others would be safe to help the next person seeking to see the future. Ona continued to work as hard as ever. The Washingtons had given her a few dollars to buy presents for her family. Ona saved some of the money for her journey. Between her tasks, she packed small bundles of clothes. She hid them with her trusted friend. One evening in May 1796, Ona quietly left the presidential mansion. She slipped out the door as the family intercepted. As instructed, she made her way to a secret place. Her heart pounded as she waited for the next call. Ona knew President Washington would send people looking for her. She hoped he would not punish her family, but she would never go back to her life of slavery at Mount Vernon. She didn't know it was ahead, but it would be better than what she left behind. Right, And she wasn't going to be able to even go back to her family because she was being sold to this other woman. Or not so given as a wedding gift. But. Her next step, step was a sea trip. Her friends arranged passage, a passage aboard the Nancy, a ship commanded by Captain John Bowyer. After five days at sea, the Nancy docked in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Ona would be forever grateful to Captain Bolus. If his part in her escape was ever found out, he could be sent to jail or worse. So all the people that helped her were risking their lives or jail time. With jumbled nerves and a racing heart, Ona wrapped herself in courage. She stepped off the ship. She walked onto the land of her new home. Ona searched the crowds of the family who would help her. What if she approached the wrong person and gave herself away? She'd be sent back to the Washingtons and face a horrible punishment. Just as her courage began to dip, a free black family stepped up and welcomed her to Portsmouth. Her doubts turned to excitement. Ona quickly looked for a job. Runaways had to be careful. The skills that made her valuable to the Washington, Mrs. Washington might all, could, could also make others suspicious. People gossiped. News might travel back to Philadelphia about a black woman in New Hampshire who was talented with a needle and thread. Instead, Ona worked hard cleaning houses and cooking for white families. She didn't complain. Though she didn't earn much money, it was enough to live on with a little left over. For the first time in her life, Ona's time belonged to her. She explored her new city. Portsmouth was smaller than Philadelphia and New York City, but it had a busy seaport. Shipbuilders thrived in Portsmouth. Captains delivered food and supplies up and down the Atlantic coast. Ona marveled at the pictures for sale in shop windows. She pictured buying them with her own money. She enjoyed the salty air. To her, it became the smell of freedom. She began to relax, but to relax completely was dangerous. No matter how careful Ona was, some things were out of her control. One day as she walked down the street, she saw a woman who looked familiar. The woman's name was Elizabeth Langone. She and her family had been frequent visitors to the presidential mansion. Ona froze with fear. Maybe Elizabeth wouldn't recognize her. Ona pretended she didn't see her and kept on walking. But Elizabeth recognized Ona. The young woman hurried home and promptly told her father about the odd, odd sighting. Her father, a senator, informed President Washington that his runaway slave was in Portsmouth. President Washington plotted Ona's return. He hired Joseph Whipple, the customs collector in Portsmouth, to find Ona and force her back to Philadelphia. Whipple tried to trick Ona. He lured her with news of a job. Ona met him, but realized there was no job. He wanted her to return to the Washingtons. Ona knew it was not wise to anger this man, so she agreed to sell back to Philadelphia, but she had a trick of her own. Whipple waited at the dock for Ona, but she never came. The Washingtons were furious when they heard. But President Washington was about to retire after two terms. Making Ona return by force would cause bad publicity. He did not want to end his publicity with a runaway slave scandal in the newspapers. Meanwhile in Portsmouth, Ona had met a free black man named Jack Sands. He worked on a ship and sailed away for months at a time. They fell in love. But when they applied for a marriage certificate, Whipple turned up again. He had not forgotten his duty to the president. He couldn't force Ona back to the Washingtons, but he could make her life difficult. Whipple used his power to delay the marriage certificate. Not very nice at all. It didn't stop Ona and Jack. They applied for a certificate in Greenland, a neighboring town. Ona and Jack were legally married January 14, 1797. The next year, Ona and Jack had a baby daughter, Eliza. Ona continued to work hard and help earn money. Slowly, her worries faded, and she began to enjoy her new life. Under law, she was still enslaved, but she lived her life as though she was a free woman. President Washington, however, could not forget the slave who outwitted him. He and Mrs. Washington still fumed over Ona's escapes. 
They wanted her back. One night, while Jack was away at sea, Ona and her baby Eliza had an unexpected visitor. It was Burwell Bassett, Mrs. Washington's nephew. Ona recognized him right away. She had seen him many times in the Washington home. Ona knew why he was at the door. The Washingtons had not given up. Bassett said the Washingtons would grant her freedom if only she would return to Mount Hermon. Do you believe that? Ona knew better. She stood her ground and refused to go with him. Bassett was just as stubborn as Ona. He couldn't believe that a slave would refuse to obey him. He hatched another plot. This time, Bassett planned to kidnap Ona. He was visiting the Langdons and discussed his plan. One of the Langdons' servants overheard Bassett talking and told Ona. Ona acted quickly. She packed her family's belongings and wrapped baby Eliza, baby Eliza in a warm blanket. Then she hurried to find a driver with a horse and carriage. They sped toward Greenland. A free black family took them in. The family watched over them until Jack returned home. Once Jack returned home, Ona and her family settled in Greenland. Under the law, Ona Marie Judge Staines remained a runaway the rest of her life. Not even the President of the United States could convince Ona to go back to Mount Vernon. Ona had carved out a life of her own where she answered to no master but herself. A newspaper reporter once asked Ona if she regretted the hard life she'd led. No, she said. I am free. So I hope you found this book super interesting. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know before. Um, it gave me a new look at the first president of the United States, but also about this amazing, brave woman who fought for the freedom that she deserved. I hope you enjoyed it. Happy reading. Thank you for listening.